2002, the race for United States Senate is brought to you live from the studios of Georgia Public Television. Here is your moderator for tonight's debate, Susan Hoffman from GPTV. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the last in our series of general election 2002 campaign debates. This debate was organized by the Atlanta Press Club. We welcome the many listeners of Georgia Public Radio. That statewide network is also broadcasting tonight's debate featuring the candidates for United States Senate. Let's meet those candidates. Saxby Chambliss is the Republican candidate. He is completing his fourth term in Congress representing Georgia's 8th District. Max Cleland is the Democratic candidate and the incumbent U.S. Senator. He has served as Georgia's Secretary of State and head of the U.S. Veterans Administration. Sandy Thomas is a Libertarian candidate. He has spent his career in the field of technology and works for an international banking technology firm. Those are the candidates. Here is the format for tonight's debate. In the first round, each candidate will have the opportunity to answer two questions from our panel of journalists. They will be allowed one minute for their answer. As moderator, I will determine if the other candidates will be given 30 seconds each for rebuttal. In the second round, the candidates will question one another. In the third round, our panelists will continue the questioning. At the end of that round, each candidate will make a one-minute closing statement. Now let's meet our panel of prominent journalists selected by the Atlanta Press Club. They are Vern Smith, former Atlanta Bureau Chief for Newsweek, Melanie Eversley from the Washington Bureau of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and Paul Yates, reporter for Fox 5 TV in Atlanta. Vern Smith will ask the first question. By random drawing, his question goes to Sandy Thomas. Good evening. Uh, sir, you are um, fond of saying that uh, among the two major party candidates, the primary difference is that of rhetoric. Um, as a libertarian, uh, should you um, occupy the seat now held by uh, Senator Cleland, what would be the first most significant the policy initiative you would uh, launch upon arrival in Washington? Well, thank you for that question. There are many important issues in the Senate before the issue right now, and those issues need to be dealt with. The most pressing issue is obviously that of our defense, the defense of our people within our borders against this very real threat of the Islamic Jihad. On the other hand, there are many areas where we need to focus on reducing the size of government so that, and turning the responsibility back to the states and back to the people so that the federal government, the Senate, and the Congress can focus on job number one, which is our common defense. All right. And the next question at this point, Melanie Eversley, your question will be for Saxby Chambliss. Good evening, Congressman. Now, uh, the families of the victims of the September 11, 2001 terror attacks would like to see an independent investigation into the attacks. I'm wondering, uh, first off, where do you stand on that? Also, how do you feel about wishes by the White House to control the leadership and subpoena power of such a commission? Well, first of all, um, uh, my subcommittee that I chair on terrorism and homeland security conducted the first significant and substantive investigation in the September 11 incident. Uh, we did the congressional investigation to determine the intelligence deficiencies that existed within our intelligence community that allowed September 11 to happen. As you know, we filed a very substantive and critical report back this summer on that issue. When the issue of whether or not to create an independent commission came up, you know what I really felt like knowing that if this commission was going to hold public hearings and all of the information that needed to be looked at was of a classified nature, I'm not sure what the commission could have accomplished. But as we got through the process, as we got into our bicameral hearings between the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee, it appeared obvious to me that we needed to move in the direction of letting the public know more than what they were being able to find out. So I have supported the independent commission. I voted for it in the intelligence bill on the House, and I will continue to support that. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Melanie, I, I would like to respond to that. Uh, I'm an original co-sponsor of legislation in the Senate the McCain-Lieberman bill that sets up an independent commission that looks at uh, the background behind 9-11, what happened, uh, to make sure that we don't let that happen again. My father served at Pearl Harbor after the attack, uh, and after that attack, quite frankly, this country uh, put together a commission that looked at Pearl Harbor and uh, made some
some decisions after World War II uh, that are still in effect today. So I think we need an independent commission, uh, and I was pleased to be an original co-sponsor in the Senate for that. All right. Paul Yates, your question to Senator Cleveland. Senator, the huge federal budget surplus predicted for the next decade has vanished. How can the government offer expensive new initiatives, certainly a prescription drug benefit under Medicare, while continuing to cut taxes? Well, first of all, we find money to do everything else. Uh, I think it's time we find some money to provide a Medicare uh, supplement for our seniors out there who are struggling tonight to pay for the cost of prescription drugs. Many seniors will go to bed tonight facing the choice of eating or taking the medicine or taking the medicine and paying rent or other expenses. So I'm an original co-sponsor with Senator Miller in the Senate of legislation that has 52 votes in the Senate to provide a prescription drug benefit under Medicare. We need to make it happen and happen soon. If, if I can, here we go again. He's not answering your question, Paul. Your question was, how are we going to pay for it? And he's not answering that. And that's the same rhetoric that we've seen out of Mr. Cleveland time and time again. On the House side, we passed a prescription drug benefit. We acted very responsibly. And the question about how you're going to pay for it was answered because we passed a budget that included funding for a prescription drug benefit. Mr. Cleveland answered that same question last week by saying he was going to pay for it out of the Social Security Trust Fund money. That's wrong. We should not do that. Uh, let me re re respond, please. <clears throat> First of all, you certainly don't pay for it by giving a $250 million tax break to Enron, as my Republican opponent has done. Uh, secondly... Now, that's got nothing to do with the yes question, it does. Mr. Yes, Clinton. it does. You need to answer first, question. first of all, my Republican opponent has given a two, voted to give a $250 million tax break to Enron at the very time that our teachers in Georgia, in terms of their pension retirement, were losing $127 million. So you don't pay for it that way. You do pay for it uh, by uh, cutting some loopholes that are in there now for major corporations to send jobs offshore, and you provide it, uh, some money by uh, revitalizing our economy through targeted tax cuts. So. Uh, uh, we have okay. means of Mr. getting Cleland, this done. We just need to get that done. The same I'll bill give you he says I seconds. voted for to give that tax break, he voted for the same bill, by the way. So if I voted to give him a tax break, he voted to give him a tax break. I'd like okay. to set the record straight, please. Uh, <laughs> I did not uh, vote for a $250 million uh, tax break for Enron. All right, we're going to move on. Vern Smith, next question is for Congressman Chambliss. Uh, Congressman, uh, you're chairman of the uh, House Subcommittee Subcommittee on Hom Homeland uh, Terror and Security. Were you as shocked as most of the nation a couple of days ago when um, a boat um, full of Haitian refugees landed um, on the shores of uh, South Florida, um, bypassing apparently not only intelligence, but even uh, the ability of the Coast Guard and other enforcement uh, efforts to uh, guard against uh, um, intrusions such as that. So one has only to uh, um, imagine a boat like that laden with uh, uh, explosives to uh, uh, become really frightened. How did that happen in your view, and what, as a senator, could uh, you uh, propose to prevent that from ever occurring? First of all, Vern, I, I, frankly, I was not shocked at it. Uh, we still got problems in our intelligence community. We've got problems in dealing with the issue of homeland security. That's why we so desperately need the creation of the new Department of Homeland Security that the President has asked for and that I have supported, that I helped write, that we have passed in the House that Senator Cleland and the obstructionist Democrats in the Senate are blocking. When we put that Department of Homeland Security agency in place, let me tell you what we'll do. We're going to bring the Coast Guard under that, and we're going to increase the size of the Coast Guard. We're going to bring the INS under that. We're going to divide the INS up into an administrative agency and an enforcement agency. That way, we'll have more people, we'll have more Border Patrol agents, we'll have more ships, we'll have more Coast Guard personnel. We can better deal with this issue of protecting our borders. And that was exactly what happened. It was just a, not just a failure from an intelligence standpoint. That, that was kind of secondary because it's hard to pick up on intelligence like that. But it was a failure to guard our border. And that is a real problem this new department will help. Okay. Uh, Time. I'd like to set the record straight, please. I voted for uh, Homeland Security Agency bill on the floor of the Senate five different times. 
I'm a co-sponsor of a legislation in the Senate to create a Homeland Security Agency. But it points out, Vern, the need for an independent commission to look at the problems of 9-11 and get at the bottom of what happened so we don't have this kind of event happen ever again in our history. Could I speak? Uh, yes, you can. Thank you. <laughs> um, after 9-11, um, our, our country was attacked on 9-11 by this awful terrorist attack. Yet, as has been pointed out here, uh, no one was held accountable, no one lost their jobs. Um, during this period of time, Congress even got a salary increase to $155,000. In my corporate life, I don't think we would have allowed this to go on quite as long. The problem is the government is too big and too cumbersome to focus on job number one, our defense. That's why we need limited government, take back responsibility for those things the citizens and the states can handle so that government and the Congress can do that job. Okay. We're going to move on. Melanie Eversley, your next question will be to Senator Cleland. Senator, the uh, sniper case in the Washington area renewed debate uh, over one issue in particular, and that's the issue over whether law enforcement would have been helped uh, in their search by a national ballistics registry. Um, I'm wondering uh, where you stand on this issue. As you know, uh, the whole question has divided supporters of gun rights and gun safety advocates. So where do you stand? Well, I believe in the Second Amendment, uh, and I was trained on many weapons uh, during the Vietnam War. May I say that... Uh, uh, I'm not sure how you're going to go out there and, and bring back in 200 million guns out there that are already out there for ballistics testing. So it's probably unrealistic to, to seek that as a solution. But I was pleased to see the FBI did have enough ballistic uh, uh, evidence to uh, uh, nail some suspects. The final question this round is Paul Yates's question, and it goes to uh, Sandy Thomas. Mr. Thomas, you've got an education choice plan that provides parents with an education tax credit, but wouldn't that uh, damage public schools even further? And is that really workable in a state like this one that has relatively few private schools? Well, uh, how we pay for education is a variety of ways. The interesting thing is we have the highest per capita spending nationwide in this country for education, about 6000 per student, but yet some of the worst results. What I've proposed specifically is that we Im eliminate the federal government's role in education, which is only about 7% of Georgia's budget, return that money to Georgia so that the state of Georgia, the local communities, and parents and teachers can decide the right solution for their students and get the federal government out of it, make it a state choice. I'd like to say <clears throat> that the, the federal money coming into Georgia means millions of dollars uh, to our local school systems out there to provide real hope and opportunity for our kids, <laughs> provides extra teachers, provides uh, Head Start monies, uh, money for safe and drug-free uh, drug schools. We can't do without that money. Many of our kids wouldn't have a chance out there, particularly in uh, rural areas and disadvantaged areas of our state. So I'm a big booster of uh, federal funding for Georgia, uh, and the more the better. All right. Let me just say to you that uh, I too support the federal ed, the uh, federal government being involved in the education system, but the difference in Mr. Cleland's position and my position is that I think local folks ought to decide how that money is used. It ought not to be coming by mandates and dictates out of Washington. If local folks need to hire more teachers, if they build, need to build more classrooms, let's provide the money, but let's let them make the decision on how best to educate our children. Uh, there is a difference between uh, me and my Republican opponent here. Uh, I favor additional Head Start programs, additional programs for safe and drug-free schools, uh, additional teachers in our schools. Uh, my Republican opponent has voted against all of that. He's even voted against uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the existence of the United States Department of Education. You know, there we go again. Uh, just making up misleading, uh, putting misleading information out there. It doesn't even merit an answer, so I'm not going to answer it. But, Max, you're misleading the folks again. Okay. That is going to wrap round one. And that does, again, conclude round one of questions from our panelists. In the second round, each candidate will ask two questions of each opponent. Candidates, you have 30 seconds to ask your questions. One minute is going to be allotted for the answer. And then the questioner has 30 seconds for rebuttal. The order of questions has been randomly selected. The first question is going to come from Senator Cleland, and it will be addressed to Congressman Chambliss. Yes. Um, I'd just like to ask my Republican opponent uh, why in the world, <clears throat> when Enron was collapsing, 
uh, basically due to the fact of corporate crooks running off with all the candy in the candy store uh, and costing teachers in Georgia and their retirement system $127 million, why my Republican opponent voted for a $250 million tax uh, benefit for Enron. Well, actually, I was trying to do a better job of protecting those folks than you, because if you'll remember when Bill Clinton in 1996 proposed that, uh, excuse me, 1998 proposed that we take 60 percent of the Social Security trust fund and to put it into uh, the stock market, you supported that. If that had been done back then, just think where Social Security would have been today. I opposed that. But, you know, there was never any tax break given to any corporation uh, as you have alluded to, uh, you voted for the same final bill that I voted for. There was no tax break given in there. I would like to see the alternative minimum tax uh, uh, eliminated. I think it's wrong. I think it's unfair. That particular provision would apply to some 30,000 corporations in the United States of America, small businesses on the Main Street in Moultrie, Georgia, and in Hiawassee, Georgia. It's wrong to tax them on the alternative minimum basis. 30,000 corporations would have benefited from it, not Enron. All right. Senator? Uh, I'd like to correct the record here and, and say that uh, my Republican opponent did vote for a $250 million tax break for Enron. And uh, that's the record. And uh, I do not agree with that. We're I'd just to like for you to show me that in the record. Show it to me in the record. I'll be, I'll be glad to, uh, when the vote in the House came, to eliminate the alternative minimum tax, which my Republican opponent just said he opposes. Uh, that was a $250 million tax break to Enron at the very time that the teachers' pension fund in Georgia was taking a hit for $127 million because of Enron's collapse. Max, you obviously don't understand what the alternative minimum tax is. It is not a tax break. It's only a tax credit if you paid taxes. There is no tax break there. All right, we're going to move on. Congressman Shambliss, your question to Sandy Thomas. Um, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Cleland uh, opposes a national missile defense system. I support a national missile defense system. We're here in a difficult time in America right now where we have a number of rogue nations out there who have the capability of delivering weapons of mass destruction into the continental United States. We have no capability to deny the entrance of, of a weapon of mass destruction by a missile coming into America. What's your position on this? Well, this is an important uh, issue, and it's a matter of priorities. I believe that uh, Congress needs to take more responsibility, more focus on, our, on the constitutional role of providing for our common defense. And I haven't seen yet um, uh, passing a resolution to give the president war powers does not address the issue of fixing some of the things that have been talked about here. We need a, a better civil defense within our countries. One of the panelists pointed out a sniper right in Washington, D.C.'s backyard, illegal immigrants uh, coming in on boats co close to our shore. So we have to shore up a lot of our local homeland defense. As far as a nuclear Missile shield goes, there are emergence nuclear powers far greater than um, Saddam Hussein, North Korea, and countries like that. And over time, these will become superpowers, and we do need a missile defense shield. I'd like to please. correct the record, please. Uh, uh, I have voted for the uh, uh, missile defense system. Um, we just appropriated some $6 billion for it in the defense authorization bill that passed the Senate recently. Well, right. Mr. Clinton, what you support is a theater missile defense system. I'm talking about a national missile defense system. Um, but, Sandy, you and I agree on that. Uh, this is a very, very serious problem for America. And what we need to deal with now, the best defense is, uh, the best offense is a good defense. And I think it's just incumbent upon America to make sure that we protect Americans. And we do so by providing a good, strong defense. I can't let the charge stand. Um, to correct the record here and make the record clear, I'm on the Armed Services Committee and have been on there for six years in the Senate. The last defense authorization bill uh, approved $6 billion for theater and national missile defense. Uh, so I'm proud to have supported it. Sandy Thomas. You're As the Congressman points out, I do agree with him on this, but I do take exception with the idea that, def that since defense is our number one job, we're spending entirely too much time in Congress arguing over the other 80 percent of the budget, $2.3 trillion, all of which could be handled by individuals and by the states. Now, no, we don't want to change these programs and harm anyone, but we need to get the federal government out of these programs, back to the states, back to the people, so they can focus on job number one, defense. 
Mr. Thomas, your question from or Senator Cleveland. Uh, Senator Cleland, at our last, uh, I've, I've discussed this with you before, that the National Taxpayers Union uh, calculated that in the year 2001, you voted for $228 billion in spending increases. That's an 11 percent increase in one year, and it was before the fiscal year ends, you know, in October, so that was before the 9-11 uh, attacks. How do we pay for this? Well, first of all, uh, to make the record clear, um, I voted for a $1.3 trillion tax cut, which had a phase down of the inheritance tax, a phase, phase out of the marriage penalty. I would add to that, uh, given our economic straits now for, as an economic stimulus, reduction of uh, corp, uh, corporate capital gains from 20% to 15%. Uh, I got a letter from President Bush thanking me for my courage in voting for the $1.3 trillion tax cut, and I'm proud to have it. I'm all, I'm, I support tax cuts as well. However, the um, tax cut is all backloaded. There's very little in this year's budget to improve our economy. And at the end of the day, we can only increase taxes, take the money from another program, or continue with the deficits that we're experiencing now, which just really is a tax on a future generation. Are we going to ask young families trying to save for a home to pay for this? Are we going to ask middle-aged families that are sending a kid to college? Are we going to ask seniors for another increase on their Social Security? or perhaps tax their investment income? My question still is, how do we pay for all this spending? I'm going to allow you to answer that unless you'd like to go on and ask your question. It is your turn to ask your question of Sandy I, Thomas. I'll answer the question. Okay. Then proceed with your question. <clears throat> Mr. Thomas, uh, you've talked a little bit about the federal income tax structure and how the libertarians feel about it. I'd like for you to share with us a little bit uh, about how libertarians see other issues facing our nation. Well, the income tax is a way of uh, discussing the issue to talk about the role of the government uh, in our defense, and that only being 20 percent of our budget. So by eliminating that and moving the functions, the necessary functions, to the states, to the people, allowing people choice of their own education, their own retirement, their own health care, uh, we would have adequate money to pay for our defense, because that is the constitutional job of the federal government, that and our civil and criminal court system. Um, many other functions of government have, have caused more problems than they've solved. Most, for example, in education and in health care, both, since the government got involved in the 70s, these things have gotten more expensive and the results aren't there to justify the expenditures in the past or the in additional expenditures in the future. All right. Congressman Chambliss, your next question will go to Senator Cleveland. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cleland, in 1993, the Clinton administration posed the largest tax increase in the history of America. Part of that tax increase was a 35 percent additional tax on Social Security benefits. I have consistently voted to roll back that 35 percent tax on senior citizens. On July the 13th, 2000, Senate Bill 188, you voted against the rollback on income tax of Social Security benefits to senior citizens. Why did you do that? Um, in 1993, I wasn't even in the Senate. And it was oh, not I'm part of about 98. 1993. I was not in the Senate. I was in Secretary of State's office in Georgia. Uh, I support a stronger Social Security system, and the reason I didn't vote for it was because your vote, uh, my Republican opponent's vote, compromised the Medicare system by 270 billion dollars. I'm not interested in compromising Social Security. I'm interested in making it stronger, as I'm interested in tacking on a prescription drug benefit under Medicare. Oh, why won't you roll back the tax on senior citizens? You just don't answer the question. Now, you talk about that $270 billion that we cut from Medicare. You know, Washington's the only city in America where spending less than what the Democrats want, and a smaller increase than what the Democrats want, is a cut. At the end of the day, you voted for that same $270 billion reduction in Medicare expenses because it was a true reform of the Medicare system which would have been broke this year according to the Clinton administration trustees if we had not reformed it in that way. Time. Uh, Go ahead, Senator. Let me correct the record here. First of all, I didn't vote to compromise Medicare and almost bankrupt it uh, as my Republican opponent did to the tune of $270 billion. Secondly, one thing I'll never support, and that is turning the Social Security benefits of those people on Main Street over the people on Wall Street to play Russian roulette with in the stock market. Now, you obviously don't remember what you voted for because you voted for that same Medicare reform package. 
We're going to move to our next question. Mr. Thomas, your question to Congressman Chambliss. Uh, Congressman Chambliss, uh, the same issue that I asked the Senator about, in the same study, you voted for $224 billion in spending increases in the year 2001. Um, that's $4 billion less than Senator Cleland, but, and, but I will give you credit for voting for $170 million of decreases. On the other hand, that's $1,300 of spending increases for every $1 of spending reduction. This isn't living gov limited government to me. How do we pay for this? Well, in 2001, we were operating under a balanced budget. As you pointed out earlier, this was prior to September 11. Pre-September 11, we were operating under a balanced budget. We were looking at surpluses as far as the eye could see. The votes that we made for increases in spending back then were within the budget that was balanced. The problem we've now run into is that September 11 has caused increases in every single federal agency. It doesn't matter whether it's defense, where we've had the largest increase since the Reagan years, whether it's housing and urban development, where we've still got September 11 issues relative to re which require additional expenditures to uh, every other federal agency out there. It's very, very difficult to, uh, to operate in times of crisis within a balanced budget as we're seeing right now. The one thing I will say about our, our president is, though, we are moving back towards a balanced budget. We're going to get there. We've got a plan to get there, and we will return to a balanced budget. Senator Cleveland, your question to Mr. Thomas. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Thomas, uh, tell us a little bit about how you would um, reform the federal tax structure. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that the federal government is $2.3 trillion. That's up 22% since 2000. And in fact, it's up from about $1.3 or $1.4 trillion since the Republican Revolution of 1994. I would propose eliminating the income tax, abolishing the IRS, and sending all the, the functions back to the states and to the people other than the defense. Now, the one issue that you have to deal with is obviously the transition issue. You want to make sure you protect seniors that are in some of these plans while giving absolute 100 percent control over their retirement to younger people. You also want to transition the phase out of the income tax, and that could be done through uh, the uh, retail sales tax. All right. Mr. Thomas, your question to Congressman Chambliss. Um, Congressman Chambliss, um, in 1994, as a freshman congressman, you went to Washington uh, as part of that freshman class and promised to end federal involvement in education. Yet recently, you agreed with the uh, vote to increase education spending by 40 percent. Why do you believe that the federal government, with all those mandates that did come with that rule, it'd be nice if it just came back to Georgia, but it came with all kinds of mandates, no choice programs. Why do you think the federal government can do a better job than the parents and teachers in determining what our children are taught in Georgia? Well, I didn't go to Washington with the idea of eliminating federal involvement in education. I mean, gee whiz, I, uh, my wife just retired after 30 years of teaching in the classroom. My mother was a teacher, my daughter's a teacher, my brother's a teacher. I have significant involvement in the public education system in Georgia. And what I do think is, though, and what we sought to do beginning in 1995, was to remove all the mandates and dictates coming out of Washington when it came to education, continue to fund education, but send the money and the power and authority relative to the decision on how that money was to be spent down to the state and local level. I trust my wife to make decisions on how to teach her children a lot better than I do some bureaucrat at the U.S. Department of Education. And that holds true for all of our other teachers in this state who are true heroes in my mind. We need those decisions made locally. We don't need those mandates coming out of Washington. And that's the direction in which we began moving in 95. Are there rebuttals on these? Yes. Um, once again, it's only 7% of the budget, and in fact, it did come with mandates. No choice programs were allowed. Today, there are more children being homeschooled than there are in charter schools or have used a voucher, as was affirmed by the Supreme Court. I'd like to see the state of Georgia have the same kind of primary and secondary education system we enjoy in our colleges. We have private, we have state, we have religious, we have vocational. Parents can, and children can pick the right vocational program for themselves. Now, of course, we fund our public uh, private, primary and secondary differently, but we do have a lot of money to fund that. We just need to redirect it and give parents choice. Senator Cleveland. My Republican opponent voted against the existence of the United States Department of Education. 
They voted against more teachers in the classroom, voted against Head Start, and voted against safe and drug-free schools. That's not a plan that we need for our state. We need federal aid to education. We need Title I monies. We need to provide hope and opportunity for our kids out there for the next generation. Ms. Cleland, there's never been a vote in the U.S. House of Representatives in my eight years in Congress to eliminate the Department of Education. I don't know where that comes from. I have never voted to eliminate Head Start. I have voted to let the states decide how they're going to spend their money. We need to fund the programs at the state and local level. If they needed to hire teachers, they ought to be able to do that. We ought not tell them that's what they've got to do with their money. And we have a fundamental disagreement about that, and I agree. But I have never voted not to fund additional teachers or additional classrooms. Time. Congressman Chambliss, your last question to Sandy Thomas. Uh, Mr. Thomas, what is your position relative to how we save, protect, and improve our Social Security system in this country? The Social Security system is really a, a matter of looking at, at common sense and simple math. I, I ask younger people about this question all the time. 85% of people 18 to 29 in a Zogby poll want choice of personal accounts. Interestingly enough, 55% of people in the same poll that are over 65 want choice of personal accounts. Probably not for themselves, but they want to save their children and grandchildren from the burden of this system. There is no trust fund. There is no lockbox. All the money has been spent. We need to offer choice now of personal accounts. We can offer, it, it, I believe in the American free enterprise system, but if you don't want to invest in stocks, you can invest in inflation protected bonds guaranteed by the U.S. government and a person starting out today would have a million dollars by the time they retired, would provide three times the income of Social Security, and they would have a million dollars for their estate. I say we need choice now while protecting seniors in the existing system. All we're talking about here is a transition plan. The reason nobody will talk about it is because there's too many votes in it. Congressman, would you like to? Well, I agree with you on one aspect of your answer there, and that is that young people need options young people who are just now coming into the workforce. The problem we have, though, is we can never, ever take any benefit or put any benefit of current recipients or those recipients who are coming on to the Social Security system in jeopardy. And that's the problem in trying to take all of the money that you're talking about and put it into uh, some sort of other account for those young folks. But we do need to have a debate on this. I think that's what's critically important. We need to debate to reform Time. a system that's worked well, but very honestly, uh, when you have a, a system that has had a return Time, of 1.9% for 40 years, we can do better. We don't need to debate Social Security. We need to uh, defend it. Last question. Senator Cleveland, your last question to Congressman Chambliss. Yes. I just uh, would like to know, again, how in the world uh, you can articulate a position um, for, for my Republican opponent to articulate a position uh, from time to time that advocates the privatization of Social Security and that risky scheme would cost some 40 percent in Social Security benefits. And with 1.1 million Georgians on Social Security, I'd like for my Republican opponent to explain how he can justify that. There's a fundamental difference in my position and your position. You've actually advocated the privatization of Social Security. I never have. In 1998, when Bill Clinton proposed taking 60 percent of the Social Security trust fund, putting it into the stock market, letting the government manage that money, you supported that. You also support increasing the eligibility age of drawing Social Security benefits. You also have been an advocate, according to the news media, of slowing the increase, the annual cost of living increase on Social Security. I've never supported any of that. Just as I said a minute ago, I support the debate on this issue. When I look at what young people are having to pay to go into the Social Security system now and what they can expect out of it, we ought to be able to give them a choice with protecting 100 percent of the benefits of current beneficiaries, my generation and other generations behind me. We can do that. We can do it. We've got smart people out there that can help us do this, and we need to have this debate. There are 1.1 million Georgians out there debating tonight whether to 
pay for their prescription drugs or eat, uh, debate whether to pay their rent or exist on a meager Social Security check. That's the debate that's going on right now. We need to make Social Security more secure. We need a Medicare prescription drug benefit that actually works. And you said last week you wanted to take their Social Security money and pay for a prescription drug benefit. You, you can't have it both ways, Mr. Cleland. We're going to move on. Mr. Thomas, your last question for Senator Cleland. Uh, Senator Cleland, on the same issue of education, um, you voted for the increase in the education budget, which was um, hailed by President Bush and President Kennedy, uh, President Bush and uh, Senator Kennedy uh, as a bipartisan effort. My question would be, why, given that these programs have not produced the results that they ask, and they only account for 7%, it wouldn't be better to leave that money, after all, it is our money that we send to Washington and then ask for it back, leave it here so that parents and teachers here can have control over their children's education and choice of schools. I believe in local control of schools, but I also believe in federal help for local schools. Um, I was proud to support the president's education reform package, and I look forward to making sure it's fully funded. I still would come back to the issue of choice. In fact, after a Cleveland Supreme Court decision that affirmed uh, the right of an inner city mother to move her children from a failing school to a religious school, as I mentioned earlier, we still have more children being homeschooled than we do in alternative choice programs to help people have an alternative to these failing schools. The final question in round two is from uh, Congressman Chambliss to Senator Cleland. Thank you. Senator, uh, Mr. Cleland, I want to go back to this issue on education because this is a critical issue for every American and every Georgian. You've got some misleading ads running out there, very negative ads uh, directed at me, criticizing my record on education. I am a strong believer in a public education system in this country. I was a very strong supporter of the President's package. My family has been involved in public education. My children, as, as am I and my wife, products of the public education system. Why do you continue to make misleading statements about my education voting record? Well, uh, my background is that I graduated from public schools here in this state. Um, they need help. Uh, they need extra teachers. They need Head Start. They need safe and drug-free schools. All these programs that I've just articulated here, my Republican opponent voted against. Plus, he voted to eliminate the United States Department of Education. And that uh, troubles me a great deal because I think it denies a lot of hope and opportunity for our young people in this state. Max, those statements are not just mis misleading, they're, uh, they're just not true. And uh, I asked you earlier to show me that vote where I voted to eliminate Department of Education. It's not there. It does not exist. You know, the, the D.A.R.E. program you referred to, that takes place in the fifth grade uh, in our public school system. My wife is a fifth grade teacher. We have a great D.A.R.E. program in Cockwood County. I have been a big fan of that program. I would never vote to eliminate a program that's working, that's a good program, particularly when I know how much my wife thinks of it. <laughs> And that does conclude our second round of questions. We return now to questions from each of our panelists. Each panelist will question candidates of his or her choice. Panelists, we please ask that you limit your questions to 15 seconds. Candidates, you will have one minute to respond. Again, as moderator, I will determine if the other candidates will be given 30 seconds for rebuttal. We're going to begin our questions with Vern Smith. Thank you. Um, Congressman, you've criticized uh, Senator Cleland for uh, not uh, supporting um, efforts to um, extend the uh, Bush uh, tax cut uh, when it uh, would run out, I think, in 2010. Um, but um, what's wrong with um, being um, careful about uh, extending a tax cut uh, into uh, uh, the millennium when um, so much would be unknown about the economic uh, uh, times of that day? Because it's just not right. It's not fair. Every American deserved that tax cut when we put it in place. I actually supported a $1.9 trillion tax package, and I think that's we passed that in the House. That should have passed in the Senate, but, uh, but they didn't pass it. They almost gutted it entirely. But, you know, 
families have got more money in their pockets today and they're able to, uh, to provide a better quality of life for their children today because of that tax package. What the Senate did was they came in and said, we're going to give you this tax, but 10 years from now, we're going to take it away from you. We're going to reach in your pocket and we're going to take money out of your paycheck every week. That's not right. We need to eliminate the death tax. We need to eliminate the capital gains tax. But at the same time, those folks who are working 40 hours a week and drawing a paycheck, having to support two or three children, who are trying to make plans on whether or not to buy a house or save money to educate their children, we don't need to tell those folks, well, you can make plans for 10 years, but at the end of 10 years, you can forget that money. That's not right to those people. We need to make the Bush tax cuts permanent. We need to have those marginal income tax reduced permanently. And we can do it. Okay, Ted. I, I would like to say that, again, I voted for a $1.3 trillion tax cut. I favor uh, the immediate elimination of the inheritance tax. I think it would stimulate small business growth and development. And small businesses created 70% of the new jobs in the boom period of the 90s. We need to do that. We need to eliminate the marriage penalty. And we need to cut capital gains from 20% to 15%. That would stimulate investment uh, in the economy, create jobs, and stimulate uh, upgrading of technology for our businesses. That's what we need to do. But the total elimination uh, of this tax cut uh, in eight years, we don't know what eight years is going to bring. We don't know what Time. the status of our defense needs are or our economy. Well, why do you want to reach in those pockets of those folks that are working 40 hours a week to support their families? to educate their children. Why do you want to tell them, we're going to reach in your pocket eight years from now and pull money back out of there? That's just not right. I would, I'd just like to say that I hope we can turn this economy around. Uh, and some of the targeted tax cuts that I have articulated, uh, I think will help. Okay. All right. Moving on. Melanie, your next question. My question is for Senator Cleland. Um, Senator, last week President Bush announced a plan to speed up the approval process for judicial nominees. Specifically, he wants time limits for the White House to submit nominations and for the Senate to confirm them. In the meantime, the White House has blamed the Senate, specifically Senate Democrats, for holding up the President's nominations. Would you respond to that? Yes. Uh, I've supported 99 percent of President Bush's nominations. Um, I will say to you that under the Constitution, uh, it's up to the Senate through the advice and consent process to advise and then consent on uh, all nominations by the President. And I think that process should stay uh, under the United States Constitution, and it's up to the Senate to do that. Paul Yates. Congressman Chambliss, you have said you were called up twice and rejected twice for military service during the Vietnam War. What were your thoughts about the potential of serving at that time? And should that matter now? I was ready to go if called, and I was called twice, and I was rejected twice for a bum knee I had. And uh, if I had been accepted, I was prepared to go, just like every other uh, American at that time uh, in my part of the world. But uh, does it matter now? There are so many people who are great citizens of America, who are providing great uh, public service to America, who never served in the military. But just because uh, somebody didn't serve doesn't disqualify them from anything. By the same token, it doesn't grant them any other privileges except the honor, respect that, that I give to every American who wore the uniform. They have my utmost respect. That's why I've worked so hard for them. In my eight years in the U.S. House of Representatives as a member of the Armed Services Committee, I've not only looked after the active force, but after our veterans. That's why I could not be more pleased that as a non-veteran running against a veteran in this campaign, that the veterans of foreign wars, their national group, would come out and endorse Saxby Chambliss in his candidacy for the United States Senate. Time. Well, may I just say, <clears throat> uh, to set the record straight here, uh, there are two people here on the panel that served during the Vietnam era. I want to congratulate uh, Sandy Thomas, my fellow Vietnam era veteran, for answering the call. Uh, I'm a lifetime member of the VFW. That decision was made in Washington by 11 people uh, based on power politics in Washington. It wasn't based on people politics uh, among the 700,000 veterans in this state, of which I'm one of them. And in terms of uh, uh, my Republican opponent, uh, his knees uh, good enough to run against me. Time. Time. Mr. Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Thomas, would you like to add anything to this discussion? 
I believe that many people, whether they were in the military or not in the military, can serve our country. Um, I do think, once again, that it's Congress that I have the argument with. They've not stood up to their constitutional duty for providing of the common defense. You know, things like judicial nominations, all these other programs, and all this argument over social welfare programs and special interests mean they don't have time to spend time on job number one, providing for our common defense. I mean, this is a, a fatal... Uh, deal and when you work for a company when you don't do job number one you don't get a new budget or job number two all right time let me just say that uh, that decision to support me by the VFW was not made in Washington DC without any confirmation from local folks the Georgia VFW recommended to the national VFW to support Saxby Chambliss they know the work that Saxby Chambliss has done for our veteran community okay. they know what mr. Cleland has not done all right. that's why that endorsement was given time Next question is from Vern Smith. Uh, Congressman, you alluded earlier to the brittle nature of some of the television advertising in this campaign, um, uh, down to uh, uh, debates over which, uh, what the actual vote was on, on certain issues. One of the things that you've hammered away at uh, is a vote um, or an alleged vote that uh, Senator Cleland made uh, in support or none support of the Boy Scouts. Um, what, um, why is that an important question for Georgia voters and what, what is the message that you're trying to convey with, the, with, the, with that ad? The focus of our campaign has been the fact that Mr. Cleland says one thing in Georgia and goes to Washington and do some, does something entirely different from what he says. And this is a good example of it. He's out of touch with the way a majority of Georgians think. On July the 14th, 2001, on Senate Bill number 189, Mr. Cleland voted to withhold federal funding from any school system in America that allows Boy Scout troops to meet on public school premises. Senator Miller voted against that. They voted opposite each other. He voted against the Boy Scouts of America. That's wrong. I think a majority of Georgians agree, an overwhelming majority of Georgians agree that that's wrong and that that is out of touch with the way Folks in Georgia expect their United States senator to vote and to lead. Um, let, me, let me set the record straight here. <clears throat> um, I never voted against the Boy Scouts. As a matter of fact, I voted to allow the Boy Scouts to meet anywhere they wanted to meet. Senator Miller and I voted alike, uh, and we voted to make sure that that decision is made at the local level by the local school system. Let now, me just, let me in, just terms tell you, Mr. in terms of the brittle nature of the ads, I might say that at the beginning of the campaign, I signed a clean campaign pledge. My Republican opponent did not. I certainly didn't put uh, my opponent's picture up with Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. The other side did. And I will say to you what Dick Russell said many years ago, my Republican uh, opponent uh, will stop uh, telling lies on me. I'll stop telling the truth on him. Well, let me just say he started running those ads way before he ever even thought about signing that agreement. Just very, very negative personal ads against me. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to send the press tonight. You'll have the vote where Senator Cleland voted in favor of the Boy Scouts. Uh, Senator Miller voted in favor of the Boy Scouts. Senator Cleland voted against the Boy Scouts. July the 14th, 2001, Senate Bill number 189. Could I'm not be clear. It's in black and white in the congressional record. And I'm glad Senator Miller has endorsed me in this campaign. And I'm right. glad President Bush has endorsed me. All right. <laughs> well, I'm proud to be an We're Eagle Scout. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud you are, Sandy. <laughs> All right. Melody, it's your chance to follow up. Uh, Congressman Chambliss, uh, earlier tonight we heard Mr. Thomas talk of his support for uh, getting rid of the income tax. I'm wondering where you stand on the proposal to eliminate income taxes and replace them with a national retail sales tax. Um, specifically, as you probably know, um, some supporters say that this tax would equal about 23 percent, but some studies have said that it could go as high as 56 percent or higher. So where do you stand on this proposal? Not only we've got a, a tax system in this country that's not fair and it's not equitable, and I support a fair and equitable system. Uh, the, the debate over the two proposals, the, fair, the uh, sales tax versus a, a um, uh, flat tax, is a debate that's been ongoing, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, I do support a national retail sales tax. Um, the, the details of it will come out in the debate. Uh, I just think this current system we've got, we've got to rip it up by the roots, we've got to throw it away, 
If we have a national retail sales tax, we can eliminate the Internal Revenue Service, which is incumbent, in my opinion, that we do. Um, with a retail sales tax, I don't know what the number will be. If you say 23 percent, my mother, who lives on a fixed income, can't afford to pay 23 percent on everything she buys. People like her have to be accommodated. But what people have to remember is, when you look at your check now, you have FICA taxes, you have uh, unemployment taxes, you have income taxes that are withheld. The income tax and the unemployment taxes under John Lender's fair tax proposal would be removed. They'd be added back to your check. Time. So people would have more money. Uh, we need the debate. Time. Thank you. Paul Yates, your turn. Senator Cleland, on this issue of a Homeland Security Department, why not give the president all the authority he wants in that department, given its vital place in national security? Uh, and I support that. <clears throat> I support giving the president, in the name of national security, the authority to make that decision and change any civil service regulations in the new Homeland Security Agency that he wants to. I just don't think we ought to do it by fiat in the Congress. I think we ought to give the president that authority and have them make that determination. And so I support uh, that legislation in the Senate. I voted five times for it. We have 51 uh, senators in the Senate who support that proposal. And uh, I hope we can create a Homeland Security Agency with that authority for the president. That's simply not correct. You don't support a bill that the president said he will sign into law. The president was in Atlanta yesterday. The president made it very clear to the people of Georgia that the bill you support would be vetoed. The one that he supports and that I support, that Senator Miller supports, would give the president flexibility to move people around in the most critical federal agency that's ever been created in this country. You've been opposed to that. You voted against that 11 times to give this president of the United States the same power and authority that every president since John F. Kennedy has had. This president has the authority to exercise, exercise that flexibility in Time. the Department of Agriculture, in the Department of Health and Human Services. Time, you Mr. ought Shales. to be willing to give it to him in the Department of Homeland Security, and you're Senate. not. <clears throat> I'd like to say that, uh, to, to set the record clear, I voted five times for a Homeland Security Agency bill on the floor of the Senate. I support a compromise. Uh, between the committee bill and the White House that gives the president the authority to waive any civil service, pr service protections in the new Homeland Security Agency that, uh, that the president wants to under the name of national security. The problem with our Homeland Security operation is not the workers, but the way they're organized. I see Mr. Thomas raising his hand. We're about to go to closing statement. If you can make it in five seconds or less. I just think, once again, it shows, points out how cumbersome the government is and how many special interests have to be listened to before we can get to the issue of our national defense. All right. The time for questions has expired. It is now time for closing statements from the candidates for United States Senate. Each candidate will have one minute. The order of closing statements has been randomly determined. The first statement will come from Senator Max Cleland. Good evening. Thank you all for watching. May I just say that uh, many years ago, President Franklin Roosevelt said the purpose of politics is to generate hope. That's certainly the reason I'm in politics. That's the reason I'm in public service, to generate hope. I do think we need to generate hope in Georgia for our young people through more teachers in the classroom, uh, more Head Start programs, more safe and drug-free schools. We need to generate uh, hope for our working families through better protections for their retirement savings. We need to generate hope for our elderly citizens on Social Security and make Social Security more secure, not less, by putting money in the stock market. We need to make sure that for those who are eligible for Medicare, that they have a prescription drug benefit under Medicare that takes care of their needs. And finally, we need to make sure that those who do access the health care system do so in a system where doctors call the shots on what's medically necessary, not insurance companies and HMOs. I'm here in this, in the, this state to run for the United States Senate and be a voice of hope for this state and for all Georgians. I need your support on November 5th. Good night. God bless you. Thank you, Senator Cleveland. The next closing statement will come from Congressman Saxby Chambliss. Well, I want to thank the Atlanta Press Club for hosting this tonight. It's been, uh, it's been very exciting for us to be here with you. I want to be your next United States Senator from Georgia. Over the next six years, whoever wins this race on Tuesday is going to be involved in making a number of decisions that are critically important to Georgians and to Americans. In my eight years in the United States House of Representatives, I have provided strong leadership. Leadership in the areas of agriculture, the number one industry in our great state. In the area of defense, where I've served on the House Armed Services Committee. In the area of education, where I've been very pleased to shepherd the President's No Child Left Behind package through the House, through the Senate, 
and see it signed into law. And now on the number one issue that's on the minds of every American, the issue of homeland security and terrorism, where I chair the subcommittee in the House on that issue, I want to transfer the same common sense, conservative values that I have voted for in the U.S. House to the United States Senate. I want to transfer that same leadership to the United States Senate. I need your vote and support on November 5th. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Congressman Shabbos. Sandy Thomas will make the final closing statement. Thank you for having me this evening. I'm running on the issues, the issues of limited government, the fact that our government is far too big to focus on job number one. I mentioned the idea that in 2001, 228 billion uh, in increased spending voted on by one candidate, 224 billion by another, an 11 percent increase. Somehow we did not get this evening to that discussion. Where does the money come from? Increase taxes, reduce that money from another program, or increase the deficit and pass it along to a future generation. I believe that the American people are smart enough to take back responsibility for important segments of their lives. For example, education, bring it back to Georgia. Let Georgians have the choice of those schools and fund them here and watch them here. Social Security, give people choice now. Senator Cleland says zero choice. Uh, uh, Representative Chambliss says only one-sixth of a young person's money could be directed this way. I say have it be completely open and we can protect people in the existing system. Go to my website sandy2002.com to see these issues and vote for me on November 5th. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandy Thomas. That concludes our debate among the candidates for United States Senate. Our thanks to the candidates and to our panel of journalists. And we thank the Atlanta Press Club for arranging tonight's debate, which has originated from the studios of Georgia Public Television and has been simulcast over Georgia Public Radio's statewide network. For more information about the Atlanta Press Club and tonight's candidates, log on to www.atlantapressclub.org. We do hope that these debates leave you better informed as you go to the polls for the upcoming general election. We invite you to join us, GPTV election night on GPTV for coverage of the 2002 vote. We're going to be joining forces with WSB TV for Georgia's only statewide television coverage of the returns. That begins at 8 p.m. I'm Susan Hoffman. Good night and thanks for tuning in to Atlanta Press Club Debates 2002. We'll bring you this debate again tonight at midnight Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Pacific.